Hello, my name is Steve Haynes. I spent 10 years working in the music industry in different aspects from orchestral to recording, education and theatre and recently gave that up to be the London Regional Official at the Musicians' Union. The MU represents over 30,000 musicians working in all different aspects of the music industry and one of those members is joining me now, Alice Monday. Alice is a former student at the Royal Academy of Music and is now a member of the London Philharmonic Orchestra. So Alice, not everyone leaves music college and walks straight into a job at the London Philharmonic Orchestra, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that path? Between my third and fourth year when I was studying for my undergrad, um, I got the opportunity to go and audition a job in Malta, which I did and I was successful getting that job, so I took a gap year during that undergrad and went over and did that for one year. I was always going to stay there just for one year. So I gained a lot of experience and with rep and how to work in a section. Um, then I came back and finished my degree and then went on to the Royal Academy to study my postgrad for two years, which was a completely different experience. During that time I started freelancing and did as many auditions as I could. I started, work, did, started working with the ballet, uh, English National Ballet, freelancing, um, a few West End shows. And during that time I auditioned at BBC Philharmonic and started my trial, which took around eight months, quite intensive work in eight months. And at the end of that I was happy to say I was successful and got the job there in 2007 and stayed there for eight years. Um, during that time I was also um, trialling and auditioning in quite a few different orchestras in London to try and come back to London in order to live with my husband again. <laughs> and um, eventually three years ago managed to get the job with the London Philharmonic. Wow, that's fantastic. Quite a journey, that. Um, so what was it like um, kind of doing the freelancing stuff, fresh out of college, and how was that? Um, you fell into the deep end quite a lot. You have no safety net. You don't have as much advice anymore from teachers or professors. Um, you're there and you're having to do it. You're having to learn quickly and produce the goods on the day quickly, sometimes at last, no last minute notice. Mm. and. The time for you to prepare for things like auditions, the practice time is gone. So that's the end and all of a sudden you have to do it. So why did you join the MU initially? I got offered what I thought then was the amazing gig. I was got offered a tour with Paul Weller and at that time I was in my early 20s and obviously <laughs> wanted to be a rock star. Um, so there's no way that I wasn't going to do it. Um, but the management on that tour advised me to join the MU so I didn't think twice about it. Absolutely, that's a really interesting point actually, we often see that quite a lot, that managers will um, advise um, artists to be a member of the MU because if something was to go wrong further down the line and it was to look to a court for example that um, you know that, that artist had been exploited in some way, it's almost a way of managers protecting themselves because they know that if you're a member of the MU then you can have a contract checked, um, you can get that legal advice to show that you entered into that agreement in all full knowledge of what you're entering into, it's a, it's a really valid point that. So when you were in the BBC Philharmonic um, how did you get involved with um, the MU in terms of, because it's, there's quite a specific structure in those employed situations, isn't there? Well, not long after I joined, um, there came a position vacant on the committee, the orchestra committee. Um, and at that point, we were renegotiating the contract at BBC Phil. Um, so I was in, immediately involved in that. I was only on the committee for a few years. For my time, you have to do a certain amount of time. Um, so for those few years, I oversaw or not oversaw, um, I was involved with renegotiating the contract directly with the MU. So it's, I mean that's a, a useful point for me to kind of highlight the structure of the MU really and um, so in my previous capacity as a musician like you are as kind of a, a member working musician um, that's kind of one side of the union um, and then I've kind of switched onto the other side if you like um, and I don't, I don't play anymore but on, on the side that, that you're on um, there are these committees aren't there so, so we have um, not just committees in orchestras but we have the freelance orchestral committee we've got the theatre section committee we've got committees for recording and broadcasting etc etc uh, which are made up of musicians like yourself who provide us with the policy if you like of the direction that they want us to take so I guess the equivalent would be me going from being a politician to being a civil servant if you like so um, yeah and then we undertake that work on behalf of the committees and we do what we're told um, to do 
Um, so I was going to ask you as well, did you get respect from your colleagues in that time whilst you were on the committee and did it feel um, useful? Did you feel like you were being useful to, to people and when people were coming with you, coming to you with questions and queries and things like yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, there's, always, there's only a, a few members that can be on the committee, so um, you get voted in and you are the voice of the orchestra, so you have to you have to talk to people every day about any problems that they may have or, and be their voice, really. Mm, interesting. And I think it's also a, a good way of uh, illustrating, um, working in a BBC orchestra, for example, about the uh, collective bargaining that the MU does. So you're talking about changes to terms and conditions. And I think um, when I first started out in the business, I certainly wasn't aware of um, how the rates are calculated for all the different aspects of the industry so whether that's in a recording studio or whether it's in an orchestra or in a theatre I think you often kind of go into those situations when you're fresh out of college and just think well that's what the rate is it's, it's easy isn't it to, un to forget that um, that those rates have been negotiated in advance by the union they're all on the website and, uh, and not only you've got that protection and the safety net but also essentially negotiating the rates as well. So what would you say are the pros and cons of either being a freelancer or having a salaried position in an orchestra? There are huge amounts of benefits to having a salary and all the benefits that come with it. Um, the knowing exactly how much money you're going to have every month, all the benefits including sick pay, maternity pay, all those things, which I don't get now. Um, however, I would say the pros of being a freelancer are you're more in control of what you do. You can plan how much you work and how much you don't. I think the attitude um, is more positive in a freelance orchestra or an orchestra that's freelance based. Um, I think the attitude in a salaried orchestra is you try and do the least amount of work you can for the money. Whereas now you get to choose. So if it's a slightly duff date and you're, you're there, you've chosen to be there, therefore no one moans about it. Whereas at BBC Phil it was often everyone was trying to get off it and then when they were there they were a little bit narky about it. So um, there are a lot of positives to, I prefer actually having, despite the fact I don't get all the benefits that I used to have, I prefer being in a freelance orchestra. So what skill set do you need as a freelancer that you don't perhaps need as a salaried employee? I think now I have to be much more aware of time management, uh, it's a much busier schedule. Um, finance management, doing my accounts and my tax has become much more. Yeah, and with a bit of a shameless plug here for the MU, but we do run um, sessions in terms of uh, you know training on kind of accounts and promoting yourself and all, all those kinds of um, aspects of the, the music industry, which, like you say, the skill set that you need as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice to students just leaving college and embarking into this big wide world of the music industry? I would say take every opportunity and make the most of every situation you possibly can. Um, but with that in mind, um, I would make sure you have a sense of worth for the product and think of the bigger picture. If you're offered a gig for what you think is not enough money, but you're desperate to do it, just think of the fact that, you, that you're not helping yourself or everyone else in the future. So we often hear these kind of stories and recurring theme is, oh, you know, I'm offering you this gig and it'll be great exposure for you. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's no money in it, but it'll lead on to other things for you. How do you approach those kinds of positions? I think it's really difficult when you're just starting out and you're being offered gigs or work uh, that promise these things. But I think you really have to have a think about your self-worth and how much worth you have in the product that you are giving. There's a hell of a lot of um, preparation and practice and many, many hours involved. Um, I think you have to remember that and also think of the bigger picture of other people that you're therefore potentially undercutting and I think being exploited like that is a really dangerous position to be in. I think something that's often missed when you uh, turn up in a work environment, especially in an orchestra, and you're all there and you are that orchestra for the day. Um, I think especially when it's, a, say, a salaried orchestra, like a BBC orchestra, where there are salaried um, people there and also freelance players as well. I think it's often dif difficult to remember that actually there are different uh, employment rights for each one of those positions, whether you're self-employed or a worker or you're an employee. Um, and how, how do you feel about um, people, you could be perhaps sitting next to someone who's not a member of the MU, who's benefiting from the rates that the MU's negotiated. That part of it I find very irritating when you, you're turning up on a session or, or working in the West End and you know the MU's negotiated the SALT agreement or session rates and you know you're paying your fees 
and therefore getting that rate, but then they're there not paying fees and still getting the same session rate. That in itself is irritating. However, I also think that when you're playing, whether it's on a daily basis or just for that day, you are you are a part of the team for that orchestra, whether it's in your specific section or or the orchestra as, as a whole. Um, music is a team a team thing. Absolutely, I could certainly tell the difference as a negotiator when I go into a, a situation where I know that I've got um, a very high percentage of membership in one particular arena um, behind me. The way that the um, other side handle those negotiations is very different to when I go into a situation where I perhaps don't have that collective strength behind me. So yeah, help me to help you, I guess I would, I would, I would say, because when I have got that strength behind me, it makes my job a lot easier and, uh, and I can achieve a lot more. So I know what it is the MU does for me, but what would you say you do for other members? So we tend to find kind of certain queries cropping up quite often. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis we get members who phone up who are perhaps uh, they teach at a school and something's gone wrong at the school and they need representation. Uh, they, as a member of a trade union they have a statutory right to be uh, accompanied by a trade union official at the disciplinary and grievance meetings. So uh, that's uh, part of what we do. They could have been doing a gig um, and they haven't been paid for it or the gig got cancelled and they're waiting on payment for that. That's something we can undertake on their behalf. Um, obviously, we need the paperwork to back that up. We spend a lot of time looking at um, bits of contracts or bits of uh, information. Um, and the, what we would say is the more that you've got in writing, the more chance we have of being able to recoup those fees if something goes wrong. Um, it's very difficult to enforce um, a, an oral ag agreement. I think people, think of contracts as these kind of verbose documents that you have to have in place. I mean, we do have contracts, sample contracts on the website for all different aspects of the industry, whether that's live, whether it's a recording session, whether it's uh, a publishing deal, um, et cetera, et cetera. So all those are on the website and you just fill in the gaps, which is obviously the ideal. But I think a, a lot of people forget that essentially a contract is just, it has to be an offer and acceptance. Something of value has to change hands and there has to be an intent to enter into a legal relationship. So it doesn't have to be a massive document. It just has to say, you know, the time, the place, the fee, who's booking you, their address, all those kinds of things. Um, but like I say, they're all covered in the contracts that we have, the sample ones online. Copyright is something that we get uh, a lot of questions about. So copyright exists uh, not only in a sound recording, but also in a composition and in an arrangement. So we find that we're advising members quite a lot on um, the implications of copyright and you know they might have been recorded on a gig and they say they weren't aware that they were going to be recorded and how do we get an extra fee for that um, and knowing the ins and outs of, of, of copyright law. Other benefits, I'm going to, I'm going to start reading them off now, uh, public liability insurance so if you were to um, anything was to go wrong you were on a, on a gig somewhere somebody was to perhaps trip up over a wire or something like that a, a piece of your equipment then um, you know public liability insurance could cover that. Uh, instrument insurance obviously that's valuable and it's associated uh, equipment as well. Accident cover professional expenses insurance, professional indemnity insurance, so I could go on. Lots of um, benefits there that essentially provide you with that safety net so that if something does go wrong, hopefully we can help. So what are your top three tips for working in the music industry? I'd say know your rights is the first one, whether you're going into a recording studio or whether you're going into a school or you're going into any kind of live environment, then, you know, what copyright protection do I have? Uh, what employment rights do I have? Know your rights, I would say. Secondly, I would say get it in writing. It's so important to get a paper trail um, so that we have something to work with if something does go wrong. So, yeah, definitely get it in writing. And the third one I'd say is join the MU.